السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. That's actually a prayer for every one of you. May the peace and blessings of the Almighty be on you, and may the Almighty grant you the contentment that your soul desperately searching for. Amen. My beloved children, my brothers, my sisters, what can I say? I just heard about some of your activities. And what you stand for and you know what I was going to talk about standing up for the same things so now I have nothing to say <laughs> perhaps I could leave could I <laughs> okay I'm very impressed with what I've seen obviously the little ones are outside still I'm addressing those who are slightly older the sponsors the members of staff the admin the heads and so on I just want to say I'm very proud of you. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't let the distractions of life and the distractions created by others deter you or make you lose focus. It is only with dedication and determination that you will excel and that you will reach the sky and beyond. So I truly pray for you and I seek the help of the Almighty that He grant you not only success in this world, but even in the hereafter. I want to start off by telling you that when we were in the wombs of our mothers, if we could have spoken, or if we were one of a set of twins, how many of you are twins? Put up your hand. Mashallah, I see a few hands, right? Mashallah, put your hands down. Imagine if you were in the wombs of your mothers or the time when you were there. Picture yourself. A small little zygote, right? Growing cells after a little while, a bit of flesh with bone. The heart starts pumping. A little while later, according to us, the soul is blown. Because in Islam, pumping of the heart does not depict life. Just like when you're brain dead, the muscle begins, according to Islam, doing its job before the soul is actually blown into it. Something you might have learned, right? But that's an Islamic way of looking at things. It's, it's a whole discussion. So 
the soul is blown in at a certain point after the heart starts pumping and you are there. To you, it's everything. It was everything. It was a world. It was a life. It was beautiful. It was amazing. You grew so rapidly, so quickly. Before you knew it, you were already developing all the other limbs and your thumbprints and everything else was developing and you were excited swimming from one end of the globe to the other. Yet the globe at that stage was only within the womb of your mother. <coughs> For you, every time she ate something sweet, you might have loved it. You might have enjoyed it. I don't know whether those were Mars bars or some ice cream or a few beautiful crispy cream donuts that you might like. But you didn't know exactly what she ate. You enjoyed it. You may have enjoyed it. You may have liked it. And as you grew older, there may have been a slight concern. Perhaps if you could have spoken and maybe if you knew. What was the concern? What's going to happen now? What's going to happen? I'm growing. This place as big as it was is becoming smaller and smaller. It's becoming smaller and smaller. And suddenly, if you were one of the twins and you spoke to your twin, you would have said, hey mate, you're taking up my space. And he or she would have said, no, you're taking up my space. Wow. And as we're growing, and we can't move anymore. What happens? Mom is getting happier and happier. You're kicking. Yes, she might be hurt. She's also having a slight anxiety attack now and again, especially if you were the firstborn. And as you become more difficult for her to carry, she's getting happier because she knows you're growing. She knows you're okay. According to you at the time, perhaps you might have thought that's the end of everything. Here's my goodbye. The reason why I say twins to make it interesting. You tell your partner, your twin, that's it, you can't move. I think that's the end of everything. Little did you know that the distance between you and the life of this world was only a few membranes, less than an inch between you and a life you never ever imagined. You never imagined, you wouldn't have imagined. If anyone told you, you wouldn't have believed. Subhanallah, you would never have believed. What was the distance between you and this life? A little membrane. And one day, just when you thought everything was done over and I'm gone, and you said your goodbyes, and suddenly, as these contractions began to get stronger and stronger, boom, lo and behold, I'm out. Where? I thought I was going to go, but this is something totally unique. Imagine if you were thinking, I wish I could have the sweetness of what I had in there. No way, nothing that you enjoyed within the womb of your mother would ever qualify to give you a smile if it were to be fed to you. Now, although at that stage, that's what you grew on. That's what made you happy. That's what you enjoyed. It was thorough. It was beautiful. Effortless. But as you came out, and moments later, here comes your twin. Hey buddy, what are you doing here? The same thing you're doing. Right? I thought everything was going to be over. Look at this. Can you see? We can now come out and see the mother who was carrying us. We never believed it. We probably wouldn't have. No matter what someone told you when you were in the wombs of your mothers, you would never have imagined where you're going to come out. And as you came out, guess what? It was a life, the life of this world. The life of this world. Everything was totally different from everything you had in the life within the womb. The Almighty tells you, my brothers and sisters, my beloved children, don't despair. This life is as temporary as that one. Just when you are growing older 
and you think things are going to come to an end and that's it it's all over and that's it perhaps goodbye buddy we're not going to see you anymore why diagnose stage 4 cancer may Allah grant you cure say Amin <coughs> or old now my bones are aching I am 80 90 and I am slouching hunchbacked and I cannot walk no more hope to walk straight again and I know I'm going I have one of one of two options either to think everything's coming to an end or to think that you know what there is a membrane that is as thin as an inch between me and the eternal life one day when you think or when people think that you have died in actual fact you have come alive that life which will have no end thereafter. <clears throat> Boom! And like, <gasps> where am I? Wow! A life you'd never have imagined whilst you're living here. That's why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, clearly says, when you get to paradise, may Allah take all of us there, say Amin. Amen. Through His mercy. Amen. When you get to paradise, Fiha ma la ra'at. ولا أذن سمعت ولا خطر على قلب بشر. In paradise, what you will have, no eye has ever seen. Okay. So whatever you've seen here, no way, it's not going to be there. It's going to be better than that. No ears have ever heard, and no heart has ever thought of. Remember. You don't think with your heart, but the heart is connected to your thoughts. That's a Quranic explanation, a beautiful explanation of the connection between the heart and the mind. And this is why sometimes when you become emotional, you know, it's from your heart, but it's connected to your mind as well. It's a long topic. We're not going to speak on that today. But the Hadith says you had never thought, never imagined, nothing you know would actually be there. This is why. When you ask the little children, what would you like to have in paradise? Let me ask some of you. The boys, what would you like to have in paradise? Put up your hand and select one of you. Okay, yes, you. What would you like to have in paradise? Something. Say something. Loudly. Big soccer goals. Big soccer goals. Is that what you said? Soccer balls. Soccer what? Balls. Goals. Goals. Oh, I thought you would have said a Bugatti, Lamborghini, something of that nature. But mashallah, it's soccer. It's okay, no problem. Can I tell you something? Whatever you want, whatever you want, when you get to paradise, you'll be shocked that what is there would dwarf what you wanted into insignificance. Just like if when you were in the wombs of your mothers, when I was there, the Almighty has told us, you won't remember, none of you will remember. Why? This life is too good, it's too beautiful. You'll never remember what's happened there. If you did, perhaps you, you wouldn't have even been able to stomach what happened. Amazing. None of us can remember the day we were born. Put your hand if you do. Few of you, you, mashallah, you guys are geniuses. It's only Unity Grammar that you have such geniuses across the globe. Allah grant us ease. To be honest, none of us remember the day we were born, right? None of us. So as we grow older, we realize that whatever we may have liked, we can't even remember what we liked and what we didn't like. The same applies when you get to the hereafter. Whatever will be there in paradise will be such that you will never be able to ask for what you had in this world. Imagine, and I always give this example, you know, the S-Class Mercedes-Benz is a nice vehicle, right? The latest one. It's a nice car. I see all the men nodding their heads. I wonder what the women like, mashallah. It's okay. You can also like an S-Class. It's fine. For you, it will be sexy class. That's okay. <laughs> by the way, by the way, you might like that vehicle here right now. I promise you, 10 years from now, you won't want the same vehicle because there's the latest, a later one. If I ask you what phone would you like today, you're going to tell me the iPhone what? X Plus. XS. Can you hear all of these? 
next year, when there is another one, you won't want this one. Just next year. So if we say, don't worry, I'll get my iPhone in Jannah. Trust me, forget about paradise. You won't want it here the following year. So don't be so low. When my son told me, I want a Bugatti in paradise, I said, son, you're going to have the worst thing that ever exists there. May Allah grant us ease. The reason I say this is to make you think for a moment. We're here on a mission. We're here on a mission. What is the mission? It's just a temporary passing phase. The Almighty has made us just like we came into this earth when we thought everything was going to end. We're going to leave this earth. Do you really think the sophisticated mind you have, the fact that I'm standing in front of you meeting you today, the love we have, the feelings we have, the people we meet, the associations we have, do you really, really think all this will suddenly just come to a boom end and that's it, never going to see you again and it's okay? Never. Such sophistication cannot just come to an end all of a sudden with, with nothing continuing. I'm going to go somewhere. I want to see you again. I want to have more time. I want to be in a place where I can meet every one of you. And I can sit and talk to you. And we can do what we'd like. So we believe and the believers believe that we are definitely going to go to such a place. In the meantime, what's the mission? The mission is, you need to recognize where you came from, number one. That's the primary thing, recognize where you came from. So where did I come from? Myself, yourselves, someone made you, right? Someone put you there. You know, they ask what came first, the egg or the chicken? Can you tell me? What came first, the egg or the chicken? chicken. Talk to me. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can hear check, so I don't know what that is. What's a check? Part chicken, part egg, right? And I tell you, we believe as Muslims that the chicken came first. Did you hear that? We believe as Muslims that the chicken came first and then the egg followed. So Adam came first and then the reproductive system operated. You follow? Allah created the creatures and then the reproduction followed. It was the plan of the Almighty. And subhanAllah, I can tell you something very interesting, very interesting. When you realize that I was made by the Maker, you realize that you are here on a mission. The same Maker is going to take me away. How do I know that? Because others have gone before me. People I love, my grandfather, my grandmother, they are gone. May Allah give them Jannah. I'm sure a lot of our loved ones have left. Where did they go? They could not have just disappeared into thin air. They went back to the one who made them in the first place. So while I'm on earth, I need to do two things. Number one, recognize your maker. Worship him alone. Alone. Alone meaning the one who made me is the only supreme deity that I owe worship to. I will put my head on the ground for who? Only for he who made me. Oh, you who made me, you are the greatest. You can only be the greatest. No one could be greater than he who made me. So I put my head on the ground for he who made me. I worship him alone. I render no act of worship for anyone besides my maker. I will respect my parents. I will respect my teachers, my elders and so on. But I don't worship them. I will respect the prophets and all those who are good people. And I will offer them whatever respect I'm allowed to offer them. But I won't render an act of worship for anyone besides my maker. That's number one. I'm going to go back to the same maker, right? When I go back, he's going to say, so did you think about where you, where you had come from and worship me alone? Or did you just worship anything and everything? Number one. Number two, he created with you so many other things. He's the same creator. Listen very carefully. This is probably a point that goes back to what your was it a vice captain had made mention of just now of the activities you guys do? Goes back to point number two. That's why I said it's part of my topic. Because of what she said, I decided to start the talk in a different way. But I think it was interesting. Okay. Number one, we said, recognize your maker, worship him alone. 
without a doubt. You're going to go back to him and he wants to just know who did you worship? You worshiped he who made you. That's why Allah actually in Hebrew, they say Elohim or Eloha. You find the one supreme deity, the maker, the only one worthy of worship is known as Eloha, Allah. Okay, Allah, which means the worshiped one. We worship him. Who is the greatest? The one we worship. Who is the one you worship? He is known as Rabbul Alameen. Rabb means the one who, the, the cherisher, the nourisher, the sustainer, the provider, the protector, the curer, and the one in whose hands lies control of every aspect of existence is known as Rabbun. He is the one who made me and therefore I worship him alone and no one else. Right? But together with me, he's made you. He's made people I love. He's made people perhaps I don't really love. He's made people I agree with. He's made people I don't agree with. He's made people of races that are different from mine. Ethnicities, nationalities, choices, brain levels, everything different from mine. He's made species besides me. He's made animals. He's made birds. He's made fish. He's made everything else. He's made besides that the plants and the ecosystem, the insects, the reptiles, everything he's made the same maker. So what does he want by all of this? He wants me to acknowledge his greatness and to love him enough to be able to respect everything he has created. There we go. When you see a poor person, it's because the Almighty is showing you the poor person in order to watch what you do. If you don't give that poor person food, it's not like they're going to die of hunger. Someone else will give them. You miss the train. The Quran says the beggar, the one who's asking, don't rebuke them. What does rebuke them mean? While you may want to abstain from giving a beggar whom you feel is a nuisance because they are healthy and they've become prone to this bad habit, you may refuse to give, but you don't rebuke. You don't swear, you don't insult, you don't belittle, you, you do not know the exact condition of this creature of the Almighty just like you are. And you know what? You need to think, I could have been in their shoes and they could have been in mine. So what did you do? You reach out, even if it's five cents. Is that too much? How many of you have five cents in your pocket? A few. How many have more than five cents that you owe? A lot. See? Five cents. I remember in Saudi Arabia many years ago when I was a student, there was the opening of one building, a wealthy man without taking names. And he said, this is a Lexus. At the time, Lexus was actually, uh, you know, introduced into the market for the first time. And he says, anyone in whose pocket is five cents will have this free of charge. They took two days. The next day, they found a man cleaning the street, five cents in his pocket. They had to give him the vehicle. And I'm thinking to myself, because everything is so expensive in this building, he thought that, you know, I'm going to let the guys take five cents out. He gave the most deserving person the vehicle. The only thing, that brother was from Bangladesh. He sold the vehicle and went back home. No more work. <coughs> anyway, that was his luck. The point I'm raising is five cents is nothing. It's zero. Allah's watching you. Are you going to give? If you're not going to give, are you, are you going to swear this man? Are you going to think bad of him? Or you're just going to walk away respectfully. The same applies to others who don't think like you. People who follow a different faith. How do you treat them? I may disagree, but respectfully. Remember that. I may not participate in something that they are participating in because I think differently. I've chosen differently, but it has to happen with respect. Why? The same creator who made you made them. What makes you so different? What makes you a bigger deal? You get me? This is part of the plan of the Almighty. Who is the winner? The Almighty has kept a day of judgment for that. Maliki Yawmiddin. In Surah Al Fatiha, we read every day owner of the day of judgment. Who is the owner of the day of judgment? The Almighty, not you, not me. So why do I keep judging people when I haven't even got to the day of judgment? So many people might lead a life that may not be so good, but towards the end, 
they softened up, they became better people. The Almighty judges you on how the match ends, not how it started. Liverpool was losing, suddenly they won. Whoa, what happened? They won, didn't they? Were they really losing? Anyway, that's a question. But the point is, you could be losing the match at the beginning. They decide who won at the end, not at the beginning. The score could be 5-0 and the other team can win 6-5. Do you agree? So when you see a person who might have a few bad habits, they might be struggling with a weakness or two, don't present yourself to them in a way that you're more superior because it might turn that that person quits their bad habit towards the end they were winning. And you and I, the opposite might happen to us. Don't judge. These are creatures of the Almighty. Don't be harmful and hurtful within yourself, within your school, to one another. So many are struggling as a result of our words to them. So many girls and boys complain of how their peers utter bad words. We create a little group of people and we keep swearing someone because of how she looks, because of how intelligent or not she may be, or he may be, because of some gift or because of the lack of a gift they have. Watch your words. They will come back to haunt you. Don't say bad words. These are the creatures of the Almighty. Did you reach out to those who looked different from you? Did you give them a little bit more time to help yourself fight the racism within that you may be struggling with? This is what makes you a better person. This is what will make this school a better school. That's why when I heard we reach out to this and we do this, I was very, very happy. And I thought to myself, wow, something I had planned to say, here goes. The school is actually doing it. But remember, the heart needs to be in order. Learn to love one another for the Almighty's sake. You have the same maker. How many of you know of a story of a man who was very thirsty in the desert and he went into this well in order to drink water? Who's heard that story? Put up your hand if you have. Hadith, statement of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Okay, I see about 20 hands, maybe a little bit more. Put them down. As he came up from that well, having quenched his thirst, it was a hot day. He saw a dog. What did he see? A dog panting, sniffing into the sand, out of thirst. You know what he said within himself? And I've said this many times and I love this hadith because it opens my mind. He said, this dog is as thirsty as I was before I went into the well to get water. The dog doesn't have a means to go into the well, <coughs> right? Let me go down into the well and get some water for the dog. So he decided for a dog. For a what? For a dog. Subhanallah. You and I know that as Muslims, when it comes to our interaction with the dog, there are a few rules and regulations that we need to follow. You know that, right? Which means we're not bad to the dogs. You know, we're not against dogs. But there are a few rules governing how we will manage the dogs. When do we see dogs coming in? It's not like the first thing we're going to do is, yeah, come, 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 you know? There's a little bit of a restriction. This man says, the dog is thirsty, let me go down. He went down, realizing, you know what, I got nothing to take the water back up. So what did he do? He took off his shoe. Please look at your shoes, guys. Look at your shoes, everyone. Right? You love your shoes, don't you? He took off his shoe and filled it with water for a dog. Would you ever, ever fill your shoe with water for a dog? Tell me, would you do that? You're saying yes because you don't have the clocks I have, you know? <laughs> Amazing. And then he comes up with that khuf. The khuf is the, what he was wearing, right? It's like a leather sock. It's, it's the shoe they used to wear at the time. And he brought the dog closer and he quenched the thirst of the dog. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says the Almighty loved the deed so much. The sincerity of this man, his compassion towards creatures of the same maker. 
that the Almighty says, forgiven you, paradise for you. How's that? How's that? That's amazing, reaching out to a dog. Today we don't even reach out to people who look like us. They are humankind. They think differently, perhaps they come from a different place. They might belong to a different ideology, a different thought, a different religion, etc, etc. This was a dog. Imagine. Why was it a dog? Does anyone know? It could have been anything else. It could have been a peacock. A peacock, someone might say, oh, he looked at it, it looked so nice. And he said, oh, wow, peacock, you know. It could have been a, a young lady walking across. And you have all the young boys fighting. I'll get the water. I'll get the water. Oh, the older the lady becomes, the less the men are. It happens. I remember one elderly lady complaining that, you know, my car was stuck on the highway. And I'm waiting for half an hour trying to flag people down. And no one stopped. And a little while later, young girl stops. And she says, I don't know how to fix your tire. But I know they'll all stop for me, so I'm here. <laughs> Within a split minute, 20, 30 young men came. How can I help? Yeah, that's the tire. <laughs> Amazing. So in order to ensure that the sincerity of this man was not compromised, it happened to be a dog. Did you get the point? Nobody can say he was not sincere. There was no reason for him to have done it. He was not trying to impress anyone. SubhanAllah. That's, that was the second point. I told you the first one, recognizing your maker, worshipping him alone. The second one, the rights of the rest of the creatures of the same maker. Please fulfill them. Learn to develop your character, your attitude. Smile at people. Talk to them with respect. Your partners, your colleagues, those you love, those you don't love. Notice I didn't say hate. I said those you don't love. There's a difference between the two. Those you agree with, those you don't agree. Those who excel and those who don't. Those who are in competition with you and those who are not. When you participate in a competition, there should be no hatred. Because without the other party, you could never have been declared a winner. Two teams. If the other one backed off not playing you, you cannot become a winner. So in order to be declared a winner, there needs to be a loser. Honor the loser. Had they not participated, you wouldn't have been a winner. It's quite deep. Anyway, my beloved children, I've spoken a lot. I hope I've got my message across to tell you we need to develop two things. Number one, go back and recognize who made you and where you're going. It will straighten you in worship. Number two, recognize the rest of the creatures of the same God Almighty. If you love the Almighty, you will love everything He made within what He has taught. I hope you've got that. And I promise you, when you love someone, everything that's important to them is important to you. You don't want to hurt, you don't want to disturb, because you know, I love this person so much, everything that's dear to them is dear to me. What about the Almighty? What about the Almighty? And I want to end by saying something very interesting. You see, the brother read some verses at the beginning, mashallah. Ya ayyuhan nas, ittaqu rabbakum. In the Quran, we hear a lot of times, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ittaqullah. Who can tell me what is the simple meaning of ittaqullah? Yes. Fear Allah. Did you hear what he said? Fear Allah. Okay. Who agrees with him? Put up your hand. Put them down. Who disagrees with him? Put up your hand. Taqwa is to create a barrier between you and the punishment of the Almighty by fulfilling the good deeds and by staying away from bad deeds. I want to tell you something. When you say fear something, we do believe in something known as the fear of the Almighty. But I want to put it into perspective today. I want to put it into perspective today. When you love someone and you love them so dearly, that love creates a certain fear. That's the fear we're talking about. A fear that is born out of tremendous love is very different from someone being scared and shaking. I fear the punishment of the Almighty. I fear displeasing the Almighty. Why? Because I love Him so much. When you love someone, you don't want 
anything to go wrong in that relationship. Do you get the point? You don't want anything to go wrong. I love Allah so much. I love my maker so much that I really fear anything that, that might go wrong in this beautiful relationship. And it might make him upset. You love your wife, you love your child, you love your friend and whoever else. You don't want any misunderstanding. You tell them, listen, listen, I didn't really mean it that way. Please, I just want to clarify this because you know, you're going out of your way to make sure that there's no misunderstanding here. I love you because you don't, you fear the destruction or some form of negativity in the relationship due to something that went wrong on your side. So it's a fear born out of love and not a fear born out of something else. So I wanted to just let you know that when you say taqwa Allah, it can fill a whole encyclopedia of meaning. I, nowadays, I've come up because the English language doesn't have a specific word that can translate taqwa Allah. But I've come up with something of late that I feel is the most accurate way of explaining to the masses what is taqwa Allah. Can I tell you what it is? Yes. Oh, you who believe, develop the correct relationship with Allah. Develop the correct relationship with Allah. Why? Automatically, you will create a barrier between you and the anger of Allah, the punishment of Allah. Taqwa, taj'ala baynaka wa bayna adhaab illahi wiqaya. Imtithali awamiri wa jtina bi nawahi. I explained that a little bit earlier. That is taqwa. And the Quran repeats it so many times. Anyway, I, I think I'm speaking a little bit too long. Brother Steve is just giving me the, the looks there, mashallah, the smile. I have, I, I have to have someone to blame. Come on. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. I love my few moments that I was speaking to you. I hope I didn't bore you guys and I hope you can actually digest what I've said. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa sallam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.